Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the eighth We Were There. This session is about Of Mice and Men, the discovery of the deadly Hanta virus in the Americas in 1993. These series was created so that the original investigators can share their stories and lessons learned so that others may be inspired to carry on their work. Uh, and with no further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Rima Kabaz, who was there as part of the outbreak. Thanks, Phoebe, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining for this episode of We Were There. Today's uh, topic is extra special for me because this investigation gave me a unique chance to work closely with many outstanding colleagues, including the panelists that we're going to hear from today. The story uh, unfolded in the early 90s when CDC looked a bit different in terms of our building facilities, campus buildings, and operations. It was nevertheless a vibrant place for public health science, especially for infectious diseases here. And one particularly important development at that time was the publication of the Institute of Medicine's uh, landmark report on emerging infectious diseases. The report was a call to action for the United States to launch a meaningful new phase in our fight against infectious diseases. A short time later, CDC published a response that outlined a bold new framework for combating infectious diseases, much of which remains in place today. The outbreak that we're going to be discussing today occurred between the issuance of these two reports, and quite fitting, the cover of that historic CDC report featured an electron micrograph of the newly discovered hantavirus. So a little about uh, the investigation from my perspective. In 1993, I was a medical epidemiologist studying non-HIV human retroviruses, and I loved what I was doing. Like many others, uh, I became concerned, as we all heard, about reports of a mysterious illness that was sickening people in the Four Corners area of the southwestern United States, it's an area of, uh, at the juncture of Arizona, Colorado, um, uh, New Mexico, and Utah, and includes the homeland of several American Indian tribes. From the outset, the uh, outbreak received intense regional and national attention, and there was widespread misunderstanding and fear among residents of the area. CDC was invited to join and proceeded to work closely on the investigation with state public health agencies, Indian Health Service, and many other partners. CDC's response was managed out of um, then NCID Director Jim Hughes's uh, office on the fifth floor of Building 1. Remember, we had no emergency operation centers back then. Shortly um, after I joined uh, the response as a team lead on the Hantavirus Task Force. As you're going to hear from our panelists, uh, the investigation evolved rapidly along several fronts, most notably epidemiology, laboratory, and ecology. And there's much that can be said about the response, but I just want to mention five takeaways that are important to me. One is discovery and innovation. And um, you'll hear from Dr. Kaizek how the combined use of serologic testing and molecular assays led to the rapid identification and characterization of a previously unrecognized hantavirus. Hantavirus had not been reported um, in the Americas um, at, uh, before at that time. Second takeaway is the role of boots on the ground disease detective work in the Four Corners area that identified who was infected and how they were exposed and became ill. The third important one is ecology and the One Health connection. So you're going to hear about the ecologic studies that showed that the primary natural host of this hantavirus was the deer mouse, Peromyscus maniculatus. This investi uh, investigation, in my mind, serves as a groundbreaking example of what we today call One Health approach that emphasizes the interconnectedness of, between human health, animal health, and the environment. A fourth takeaway is collaboration with partners. I was key to the success of this investigation, and it is a vital part of all our public health um, investigations. 
And a fifth one, uh, last but not least, is cultural awareness and stigmatization. News media coverage of this outbreak combined with rumors and misinformation, including calling this the Navajo uh, flu, contributed to local misunderstanding about the illness and many local American Indian residents endured stigmatization and other negative effects of these uh, stories. Public health has since learned to recognize the adverse consequences of stigma during outbreaks, such as SARS, H1N1 pandemic influenza, and Ebola. So um, in closing my opening remarks, I want to say that this 1993 response remains, in my mind, an illustrative example of how CDC detects, investigates, contains, and prevents outbreaks of emerging infectious diseases today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kabaz. And with uh, that, I'd like to introduce the first boots on the ground for the speaker we have, uh, Dr. Jay Butler. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. And if anybody's streaming from the other side of the Mississippi, good, good morning. So this is uh, an awesome responsibility and uh, a little bit intimidating because I'm going to describe my perspectives on an effort that involved hundreds of people and literally dozens of, of agencies. Uh, so disclosure number one is I'm starting out depending on the accuracy of neurons that have lied quiescent for nearly a quarter of a century and have just begun to fire again over the past 10 days. So the story really begins in April and May of 2013 when a number of people developed a severe respiratory illness in the Four Corners region of the Southwest. The illness was characterized by sudden onset of headache, fever, myalgia, and then rapidly progressed to respiratory distress. And uh, patients who were evaluated during that prodromal phase often had a normal chest radiograph, as you see here, but rapidly progressed over 24 to 48 hours to signs and symptoms of acute respiratory distress syndrome, or ARDS. The initial cluster that I think really began to get people's attention was when a, a very popular cross-country runner uh, developed the symptoms and actually collapsed on his way to his fiance's funeral, who had also developed the same uh, syndrome and died very rapidly after hospitalization. There were a number of uh, observations made by astute clinicians, uh, including Bruce Tempest at the Gallup Indian Medical Center, Dr. Pally, Patty McFeely, uh, also Indian health service providers that were on the Navajo reservation. Alan Craig was at the Shiprock Hospital and actually jumped out of the frying pan into the fire to become the medical director of the Navajo Area Indian Health Service at the time when the outbreak was uh, really being recognized and the investigation was launched. Uh, Dr. Dini Golnick and Tom Hennessy at the Crown Point Medical Center also had been seeing cases. So calls were made to the New Mexico State Health Department, also to Jim Cheek, who was at the Indian Health Service Headquarters West office and was overseeing a lot of the response around infectious diseases. So on the evening of May, Thursday, May 27th, the official invitation for CDC to become involved in the investigation, working with the State Health Department and the Indian Health Service, as well as the Navajo Nation Health Department was issued. So on the morning of uh, Friday, May 28th, for me, it started out as a Friday before a three-day weekend. I pedaled my bike in from Tucker because the plan was after the evening traffic had died down. My wife was going to pick me up. We were going to spend the weekend with family in North Carolina. That didn't happen. I was a little late getting in. I remember being stuck at the Fraser Road uh, rail crossing, waiting for a slow-moving freight train to, to get by. So I was kind of hurrying, getting a shower, ran up the, the back steps of the old Building 1, and going down the fourth floor past the enteric section to respiratory disease branch, ran into Jay Winger, who said, can you come with me up to Jim Hughes's office? 
And here's our first uh, difference in memories, Rima. I think that was on the sixth floor, but uh, the building's gone. There's no way to, to be able to test that. So, uh, couldn't resist that. So, uh, th there was uh, the time with uh, Jay Winger, Jim Hughes, uh, Ruth Berkelman, uh, Rob Bryman, and uh, I got a quick briefing on what was going on. And the thought was, we need to get a team into the field. So. The decision was made that uh, I would go as, quote, the senior staff person uh, as, I guess, starting my second year at uh, the CDC in Atlanta, along with two EIS officers yet to be identified. There were a number of meetings that then occurred that day. Now, here's disclosure number two. Uh, I worry about those quarter century old neurons. So I actually have a box of notes and different newspaper clippings and things like that, uh, which you see over here. It's been stored in my barn in Anchorage for uh, the past couple of decades. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'd like to point out that mice have chewed at this. <laughs> and I think really we're interested in destroying the evidence. but. <laughs> But looking at those notes uh, and kind of thinking through that day, it really was back-to-back -back meetings. And there were recurring concerns about, we don't know what's going on. Let's try to develop a differential diagnosis. An issue that I think we still struggle with in disease outbreaks of unknown etiology is the appropriate triage of clinical specimens and getting them to where they need to be for a broad range of, of diagnostic tests. There was the crucial need for convalescent serum specimens, and we knew of very few survivors at that point, but that was one of the, the holy grails going out, was to find some survivors so that we can get some convalescent specimens. And finally, biocontainment for how would we manage these specimens. Now, this was the days of the, the VIP specimen transport, the violin pocket. And we recognized even then that that was probably not the best approach to what may be uh, potentially a dangerous infectious disease. So uh, we wanted to make sure that the specimens were handled under uh, P3 or higher. The organization that developed as the day went on was a field team, uh, EIS officer Dr. Jeff Dushin, also EIS officer Ron Mullenauer, and myself would go out. Uh, I actually had a ticket that returned me to Atlanta the next Wednesday. Good thing that was a reimbursable fare. Uh, we, because we're going into three-day weekend, exchanged a lot of home phone numbers. Uh, Rob Bryman, Louisa Chapman were two representatives of the Division of Bacterial Diseases and the Division of Viral Diseases. We also had uh, as our lead in New Mexico the state epidemiologist, Dr. Max Sewell at Indian Health Service, Jim Cheek. Uh, and it's interesting to look back, and we, we've actually been talking about this, that there's a lot of people say, oh, I knew it was a hantavirus all along. I, I certainly didn't, but I did find, and th this is actually something I didn't notice in my notes until a couple years later, that there was a meeting in Mitch Cohen's office up on the fourth floor, as I recall, of Building One. I have a brick from Building One uh, that's next to that box in my barn, by the way. I didn't buy it. There was no barbed wire on the fence. I didn't know he was going to sell them. So I probably owe the EIS Alumni Society some money. I digress. <laughs> C.J. Peters was in this uh, meeting. And I have uh, that he stated during that meeting that the pattern of cases runs parallel to rodent-borne Hanton virus. And I have to confess that I didn't think about hantaviruses for another week after that. And years later, I asked CJ about it, and he just kind of shrugged. Uh, but that was CJ Peters. He was quite a, a remarkable fellow and, and still is. Uh, so our plan was to uh, come into the state very quietly, support behind the scenes. Uh, this is the point in the audio where we insert the sound of the phonograph needle scratching across the record. Uh, next day, there was uh, banner headlines uh, about our arrival. The other, two other things on this uh, front page of the paper, which I think are noteworthy. One is we arrived to find that people were very on edge. Uh, the night before we arrived, there had been a uh, dance outside of Gallup. Uh, a young woman had actually collapsed on the dance floor, been taken to Gallup Indian Medical Center. Resuscitation efforts were unsuccessful. 
the clinicians involved describing suctioning up all kinds of frothy pink fluid. She seemed to be in pulmonary edema, uh, but they could not resuscitate this otherwise young and previously healthy woman. We arrived late morning on Saturday, the 29th of May, and went right into a meeting at the University of New Mexico. And actually, uh, press was allowed to come in and snap a, a picture of it, which you, you see here. That meeting went for, as I recall, five hours. And we discussed a wide variety of, of issues. One started with just the clinical picture, and it seemed to reinforce what we had originally heard, that there was a prodrome of a flu-like illness with myalgia, headache, and fever, followed by a rapid progression to respiratory distress. Now, at this point in time, we didn't know of many uh, survivors, but a comment was made that uh, people who survived seemed to recover fairly quickly also, which uh, May, may very well tell us a little bit uh, that we didn't know at the time. Uh, the ARDS picture, this was back when there were sort of the routine admissions, Juan Gans catheter placement. Everybody had normal pulmonary artery wedge pressures, suggesting that it wasn't an issue with heart failure, but rather uh, capillary leak, primarily involving the lungs. The uh, LDH levels were often very high, again, suggesting uh, some bad juju going on in the lungs. That, that's a medical term for those of you who aren't in medicine. Uh, and the, the complete blood count showed usually uh, a high blood count, uh, sometimes a profound leukocytosis with a, a huge left shift, and there was also moderate thrombocytopenia. The earliest cases had been treated according to the routine for community-acquired pneumonia with a third-generation cephalosporin and intravenous erythromycin, uh, apparently with no response. At the intensive care unit at the university hospital, they had started uh, adding uh, doxycycline and amantadine as well. Again, no uh, at least anecdotal responses. There had been extensive diagnostic testing done routinely, but those uh, results were not uh, indicating any particular etiology. A case definition for the descriptive epidemiology and hypothesis generation was developed, and that was a very simple, a severe case of pulmonary illness characterized, uh, consistent with ARDS occurring in a resident of New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, or Colorado since January 1st of 1993. In looking at people who met that definition, it was observed that the case list at that time, which was about 12 to 15 people, tended to involve people who were young and oftentimes very athletic. It also was noted that the weather had been cooler and wetter than normal during that spring, although there's nothing in my notes to suggest that we had any conversation about rodents at that time. There were a number of concerns. Uh, Kurt Nolte and Edith Ullman uh, from the medical examiner's office were there, and they shared some of their observations at the autopsies, but also shared that one of the autopsy techs who had assisted in two of the autopsies was ill with uh, pharyngitis and gastrointestinal symptoms. Didn't sound like the same thing, but it really raised concerns about biocontainment, even surrounding uh, performance of the autopsies. Infection control was a big issue. Uh, the intensive care unit at the University of New Mexico Hospital in Albuquerque had closed to new admissions. They were instituting respiratory precautions. There was very intense media attention, and that continued to, to ramp up. And because of the media attention, uh, we actually had discussion about what to call the illness, because it's a little hard to, to go into a press conference and talk about the disease manifest as ARDS of unknown etiology. And indeed, the media would quickly fill that niche if we didn't come up with something. So uh, across the top there, you see the most common name, the mystery illness. Uh, on Tuesday of the following week, I actually joined the, the team making clinical rounds in the intensive care unit at the UNM hospital. And the residents uh, would talk about the patients with TMI, this mystery illness.
Mystery flu was a term that was used. I think the most unfortunate was, uh, as you see here in USA Today, Navajo flu. Uh, not only was that stigmatizing, it wasn't even epidemiologically correct, because we certainly had people who were not Navajo, did not live on the reservation, who were showing up on our line list at this point. Because of the geographic location, Four Corners illness was also used. Over here on the, uh, the far right of the slide, you see uh, a reference to the Four Corners virus, and I'm going to leave it to Dr. Kaizak to talk about the actual naming of the virus. But once the hantavirus etiology was known, the, the name hantavirus acute respiratory distress syndrome was floated, which quickly became HARDS, and I'm glad that that was abandoned. So regarding infection control, there really was a great deal of concern in the intensive care unit at the university hospital, of course, a state-of-the-art facility that can institute a lot of aggressive respiratory precautions. Out in the clinics, it was a little tougher because uh, any of you who've been primary care physicians uh, know how you, what a struggle it is when a child comes in with chicken pox or measles or some other airborne illness. Uh, this was a, a sign uh, that I saw at one of the clinics and snapped a picture of uh, instructing people to stay in their car and uh, let them know uh, if you were present and uh, someone would come out and see you in your car. Maybe that was the first uh, drive-through health care. So on Sunday, May 30th, uh, again, we were struggling to have our, our quiet behind the scenes work. Uh, my uh, phone in the hotel, this was before cell phones, really. Uh, I think we had some of the earliest cell phones. I remember seeing people holding bricks against the side of their head, wondering what that was about. But it was uh, Max Sewell, the state epidemiologist, saying, I, I need you in Santa Fe in two hours. We're having a press conference. And I said, well, CDC doesn't usually participate in the state. Uh, press conferences, and he said, well, we're here, we're having the press conference to say you're here, and we can't have the cameras panned to an empty chair. Can you please be here? So uh, met briefly with uh, Jeff and Ron. They were going over to the hospital. I went up to, to Santa Fe and uh, did the press conference. It was an interesting uh, discussion overall. There was, uh, I think, an anticipation that we would have an answer uh, already, uh, and if not, by tomorrow. But at this point, the, the media coverage was pretty accurate in terms of presenting the data and saying, uh, this is an unusual cluster. I didn't use the word epidemic, but it's used there. Uh, but nothing fits. And uh, Dr. Ron Voorhees was the deputy state epidemiologist. And it looked at the fact that there were things like healthcare providers were not apparently being impacted and had tried to provide at least some reassurance that it doesn't appear to be a highly contagious uh, disease. Um, for myself, I had a chance to talk about some of the history of outbreaks of unknown etiology, but what really sobered me the most was referring to the Legionnaire's disease epidemic and saying uh, that was six months later before the etiology was identified. And there was a, a moment of silence, and I heard one of the reporters say under their breath, I didn't know that. And I hope that, and I, I thought that's that point, you know, we were there, but we didn't want to be there because this was going to be a, a long go if we didn't have an etiology discovered fairly quickly. And indeed, uh, the media was uh, both a friend and a foe in terms of getting information out. I think this epidemic may have been the first where the media preceded us, uh, kind of like uh, toxic shock syndrome and Legionnaire's disease were the first media outbreaks. This was uh, one that not only was covered by the news media, but more like the Gulf War, the media was there first. And so even as we first began to approach people, we sometimes met signs like this. After the hantavirus etiology was identified, uh, there was still a lot of frustration with the media as reflected by this political cartoon in the Navajo Times. And indeed, there were a number of surreal moments, such as a couple weeks later when the tabloids ran uh, this file. Uh, Jamie Childs, who you'll hear from in a bit, and I met with some Navajo Nation leaders, and uh, one gentleman actually pulled this out and um, walked through with us uh, all the uh, real uh, tragedies of how the federal government has uh, treated Native American people over the, the centuries and said, why should we not think you've brought this to us as, as well? 
And uh, we knew in our heart of hearts that this was not so much an accusation as a political statement, uh, but I was young and couldn't resist responding that, uh, well, you know, I hope you read the article because they quote someone named Norm Covert, which I assumed was some Dickensian fiction, what a great name for uh, someone who is quoted in an article on the CIA. But uh, I was still young, I was learning, and uh, I think when I die, maybe my tombstone should read uh, no Norm Covert Lives. Uh, he is a real person. He's actually published a book on the history of Fort Detrick. So uh, no Norm Covert, if you're out there listening somewhere, I'm sorry that I denied your existence. And of course, there's politics involved as well. Surreal moment number two was uh, when we got a message from the White House saying that the First Lady had been on the reservation just a couple of weeks before we arrived, and did we think there was any health risk for her? And of course, at this time, we did not know what the disease was, we didn't know what the incubation period was, uh, and we said, no, we're, no, no concerns at all. No, we uh, shared that um, the investigation was ongoing and we didn't really have any any specific uh, advice to provide. This also led to another press event, which was, uh, I'll say it was a bit distracting, but it was also another learning experience. Uh, the phone rings, and it was Bob Howard at CDC. And he said, there's going to be a press event tomorrow in Window Rock, Arizona, hosted by Peterson Zaw, the president of the Navajo Nation, and Senator Peter uh, uh, Domenici. And uh, they want the senior people from CDC and Indian Health Service there. And I said, good, uh, who are we sending? And the answer was, there'll be a plane uh, at the airport tomorrow morning to take you to Window Rock. So uh, that was uh, my first experience with that kind of uh, press event. Uh, ben Munetta uh, was with me from Indian Health Service. They actually introduced him as the director of the Indian Health Service. So Ben was uh, an old friend from my EIS class. And, I said, congratulations on your field promotion. Uh, they uh, had a question for me, though, about what was going on in the labs at CDC. And uh, I think Senator Domenici sort of spotted the vacant look on my face. And I started stumbling through some generalities about polymerase chain reaction. And uh, he, he jumped in and told me he had just gotten off the phone with uh, the director of the CDC and gave me what I would call a field briefing that gave me enough information that I was then able to talk about some of the work that was going on in the triage of specimens and that we're casting a broad net for infectious diseases and considering toxins as well. And I'm uh, grateful to Senator Domenici ever since. So uh, the media did uh, also do some other things that I think were uh, not as helpful. Uh, one of the network medical reporters, uh, this was Timothy Johnson, actually went on and advised people to avoid travel to the Southwest. Uh, I actually took a picture of what I scribbled in the margin of my notebook here. Too late for us, Tim. Uh, but this was concerning, and uh, there are a number of aspects of this outbreak, as Dr. Cabaz mentioned, that were somewhat uh, prescient of what was going to be happening in public health over the next quarter century. No one used the term social determinants of health at the time, but the impact on the local economy was really quite huge, and this is an area where the local economy is not very robust, depends on tourism, depends on the uh, the sale of the, uh, the hand-woven rugs. And uh, as you can see from some of the headlines, uh, rug sales were down. It literally was months before the, the tourist industry could recover from the hit that they took. But then uh, on June 3rd, in my memory and in my notes, the first breakthrough was, and this is represented by uh, a fax here from uh, Pierre Roland to Tom uh, Kaizak in the Viral Special Pathogens Lab. And briefly, what it represents is evidence of cross-reactivity of a hantavirus, uh, looking at some of the specimens from the patients. Now, as I mentioned earlier, hantavirus is not something we had been talking about the entire week, but this was uh, a glimmer of hope, although it was one that uh, we really wanted confirmation on because we are now talking about a virus that had not been identified in a pathogenic form in humans in the New World before. 
it was also manifesting as a respiratory pathogen, even though we mostly know of it as a, a renal pathogen. And things began to, this really helped bring focus to the investigation and started then a whole chain of events that Dr. Kaizak will tell you more about, that including developing a PCR by Dr. Stuart Nickel, uh, work by Sharif Zaki, who's also here with us today, and developing an immuno immunohistochemical stain, and really allowed us to know uh, what we were dealing with much more quickly. So with that focus, we could then move into a multi-pronged investigation, including a clinical description of what would later become known as hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, uh, led by Dr. Jeff Dushin, looking at uh, predictive clinical findings for HPS because they weren't very specific and we knew flu season was coming as well, and I believe uh, Dr. Chuck Vitek took the lead on that. There was an open libel trial of intravenous ribavirin led by Dr. Luisa Castrodale. There was the rodent trapping and testing uh, led by Dr. Jamie Childs, and he'll give you a, a whole uh, world view of, of that. And then a uh, case control study of risk factors led by Dr. Paul Zeitz. Also at this time, uh, Rob Bryman came out, the, the Calvary to the rescue, with a whole slew of EIS officers, which really helped us uh, organize some of the epidemiological investigations. So uh, on the evening of June 4th, the State Health Department called a press conference to announce the, the findings of evidence of hantavirus as an etiology. Uh, I realized that from Albuquerque or Santa Fe, we were too far away. Uh, so I drove to Gallup that evening to sort of set up uh, what later would be the field station. Uh, checking into hotel just off of I-40 was a bit of a surreal experience because the cast and crew from uh, Natural Born Killers was staying there. So uh, I remember one morning coming, leaving the hotel just as they were coming in, and uh, that was one of those things where I'm pinching myself. Am I still asleep and dreaming this? This is weird. Um, set up shop, I realized early on it wasn't going to be a matter of working out of the hotel room. I needed a fax machine, uh, went over to the hospital, made friends with the charge nurse on the, a, uh, the OB floor, and was able to work from the doctor's work area over the weekend and uh, faxed some draft case control study questionnaires back and forth. The most important call I got that weekend was from somebody at CDC that recognized this guy's going down for the third time. Let's send him some more help. Uh, Pat McConnell came out. I didn't even know what a public health advisor was at that time, but Pat really saved our bacon in terms of coming in, recognizing the logistical needs we had, and making it happen. And that really was important. I mean, for one thing, just transport uh, around the area. Uh, he got us a GSA van. Uh, I, I dropped the exhaust system on a cattle grate, uh, but fortunately that was when Pierre Roland was out, and not only is he a world-class virologist, he also can put a muffler back using just a coat hanger. Uh, the trapping teams were going to be arriving uh, very soon as well. Uh, these were uh, pretty harsh conditions. It could be really hot out there. Pat made sure that we had uh, some portable shade as well as water. He even had a Coke machine for us, which somehow that seems kind of antithetical to public health, but those Cokes really tasted good on a, a hot day. I should say sodas. That's not a commercial endorsement. Uh, and, of course, the PPE was important as well. There's a picture of Luisa Castrodale, uh, who helped one day with uh, some of the trapping, uh, getting the PPE in. I, I know whites faded uh, to yellows over the two-month period because we bought all of the bleach that was available in all of the stores in southwestern United States. And we had a space then to be able to manage questionnaires, uh, data management. Uh, we had then uh, PCs available. Um, and you can see some of the questionnaires here. The case control study was very uh, ambitious, uh, led by Paul Zeitz over there on the, the right, and we had a number of personnel joining us from the IHS area office. Uh, Rick Haskins, uh, John Sarowski, uh, Pat Bohan, uh, and also Sue Reef uh, had joined us from Atlanta and was really integral in doing some of the behind-the-scenes work in data management. 
Uh, it also gave us a place to be able to uh, meet and to have offices for people from other agencies, such as the area office, the Navajo Nation Health Department. And it literally was such a team. We, we had a, a visiting state legislator, and I'm, I'm walking them around, and I realized, uh, introduced them to somebody, I didn't know who they worked for. Uh, so we really were uh, a tight and, and seamless team. We also had an opportunity then to uh, work with the Johns Hopkins Center for Alaska Native and American Indian Health Studies. Matthew Santosham in Baltimore and Ray Reed, who is in the Southwest, was able to provide a half-day cultural orientation to us, which was really important. At one point, it wasn't clear if we were going to be able to do the investigation on the Navajo uh, Reservation. Uh, we were planning to go ahead off the reservation if necessary, but very fortunately, uh, President Zaw uh, agreed to let us uh, come in and actually said, well, I, I have the Navajo Nation police. If the media bothers you, uh, I'll call out the police. So he was actually very helpful. And uh, I know Jamie and I had a very productive meeting with him, and uh, he, I think he called Jamie his uh, high-priced high mouse catcher. And so uh, Jamie was really integral in opening those, those doors. So there were issues to address uh, that were challenges. Racism was, was a huge one. And uh, of course, our own uh, cultural incompetence was a challenge, particularly the uh, under we needed a crash course in how to approach uh, someone who is grieving. Uh, as I mentioned, that's true universally, but is even more complicated in Navajo culture if that's not a culture that you've come from. I think it was very clear that there were issues surrounding uh, racism. Some, some of it uh, was borderline humorous in terms of you'd see people with out-of-state plates driving through with respiratory uh, masks on. Others were really heartbreaking, such as the high school group that was to visit uh, an amusement park and were instructed they weren't to come. Uh, I don't recall anything like that happening with a group of white kids coming from Lyme, Connecticut in the 70s. So there clearly was a stigma uh, attached to this disease. Uh, in that uh, was something that, uh, again, a social determinant of health that we didn't use that phrase at the time, but was very important. But it did create opportunities for health communication. One thing uh, CDC could say is this is not a Navajo disease. This is a, uh, a, a disease that affects everyone who is exposed. It also uh, provided a chance for us to begin getting out what we thought were some of the prevention messages, because cases were continuing to occur even as we were identifying the, the etiology and uh, beginning to develop a suspect list, list of uh, carriers, including then some very focused health education materials, uh, brochures. This is actually a trifold brochure, some briefer posters that were available by late June and early July. And then, of course, getting the message out to healthcare providers, just a couple of the MMWRs that came out in the first couple of weeks after the investigation started. So in closing, uh, Rima touched on a number of these issues, but I think this outbreak and the response uh, really did change the conversation around public health in a number of areas, including emerging infectious diseases. The first IOM report had just come out a year earlier, and this outbreak highlighted the importance that this was not just a theoretical threat, but a real world threat. Uh, no one was using the term One Health at the time, as uh, Dr. Kabaz was uh, mentioning earlier, but it began to expand the conversation beyond just domestic animals and agriculture, but also to look at wildlife, and also started more of the conversation about the role of climate. And then finally, the important role of tribes and tribal health agencies in public health. And we look at how much has changed in 25 years. Now CDC has a center for state tribal local and territorial support. Uh, we now have the Cherokee Nation is an accredited public health agency, and five more tribal health agencies are now in the process of achieving accreditation. So the conversation has changed around tribal entities, and increasingly public health is recognized as a function of tribes in their role as sovereign nations.
Also pertinent to 2018, uh, the role of the astute clinician, uh, the uh, importance of building state, tribal, and local health department infrastructure in preparedness and response, and especially coming from a state, I want to emphasize the role of CDC as a global resource for global health security. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop, and I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Tom Kaizak. I get to play the uh, opening gig for the real rock stars. So, uh, Tom, there was a lot going on in the lab uh, that Senator Domenici gave me uh, only five seconds of. So come tell us what was going on back at the ranch. Well, it's fun to be here, and I hope to do this, uh, give it proper credit anyway. Uh, I was there anyway. Uh, so uh, special pathogens had been sort of reconstituted. I was uh, in the Army at Fort Detrick, and probably the event that led for a big changeover happened to be the uh, rest in Ebola outbreak. And I came with Dr. C.J. Peters uh, immediately following that, having uh, participated and worked on Ebola as well as other uh, disease is important to uh, the military. You see a list of them there, but Hanaviruses was one of them. A drug trial was being conducted in China uh, on Korean hemorrhagic fever with ribavirin, which uh, plays out in this story as well. And I had been involved in developing diagnostic tests. And Dr. Pierre Rolan, uh, who you see pictured here, actually is part of the rest in outbreak, putting on a uh, sort of field adaptable spacesuit, uh, was also part of that response. Uh, and Stuart Nickel, who uh, plays also a very prominent role in this, had come from the University of Nevada at Reno uh, in 92. I, I was actually the first of uh, the guys pictured here to arrive in August of 91. So this has already been uh, recounted. Uh, so uh, the first I remember hearing about this is there's an award given in uh, DVRD, or what was DVRD, called the Pekka Hallinan Award, and I had developed some LASA diagnostics, and I had given a presentation, I think, on the Friday before the holiday. And the first I remember hearing about it was Brian Mahi approaching me at the tavern up the road here, PJ's, and uh, dropping a dime on myself and Pierre about this sort of happening. And uh, then this first week of June, which would have followed, involved uh, materials finally arriving from New Mexico and their distribution uh, and, uh, you know, I, we didn't test just for Hanaviruses. This was a very broad-based uh, approach, and we test for a number of the hemorrhagic fevers uh, that we were responsible for, uh, the uh, uh, several Hanaviruses uh, in tests developed at Fort Detrick that were among those uh, that were applied. And as Jay already pointed out, there was a lot of excitement, at least in the New Mexico area, which was beginning to carry over uh, to us here in Atlanta, who were involved in this as well. Uh, so, so diagnostics of Hanaviruses in general, uh, uh, prior to the discovery of this agent in the New World and here in the, uh, the Americas, uh, was really based on serology. It was, first of all, based on an indirect fluorescent antibody assay, which is detecting uh, antibody that develops. With, with Hanaviruses, actually, they have a fairly long incubation period, and the antibody is a fairly early thing that develops, so it's not it, like it's altogether useless for acute diagnosis, but diagnosis, but uh, the uh, indirect fluorescent antibody uh, assay is pretty subjective, and I think it's uh, often overinterpreted. Uh, so uh, part of what I did at uh, Dietrich was to help to develop uh, newer generation assays for detecting IgM and IgG using ELISA tests. And uh, because we were involved in uh, not only in uh, Korea and China, but also in Europe, we developed a couple of other assays, some of which we applied. So this, this was, if you read the last sentence in the abstract here, uh, we uh, went back in a collection of materials from the Korean hemorrhagic fever uh, cases that occurred during the Korean War. A guy named Joe Smedell, who's uh, sort of a legendary figure in infectious diseases, had collected and put away lyophilized materials from patients. And we went back through this collection and were able to uh, show that this uh, IgM assay in particular was a very good means of doing acute diagnosis. Uh, it says here, the method of choice, I think. Uh, and so 
uh, again, that's what we ended up applying as, as well as these other uh, viruses, uh, other tests rather for other viruses. We went backwards there somehow. And J uh, Jay already showed this slide, but uh, essentially the uh, week after we found out about this, the materials were set up and uh, we set up a virus isolation attempts as well as a variety of ELISAs and then uh, I went off to Fort Detrick because there was a meeting uh, with uh, some Russians about HANA viruses, and uh, we had sort of set these up, and then I went off, and then Pierre uh, sent this fax up to Fort Detrick, uh, which, uh, as Jay indicated, uh, using not the viruses that occur here, but these other viruses that we had worked in other regional parts of the, the world showed some cross-reactivity. So this was really the first evidence that pointed us in the direction of hantaviruses, and it did set off a cascade of uh, use. I mean, one of the first things uh, I can remember quite clearly was a discussion with CJ about getting some of uh, our colleagues who could collect rodents out to the field where some of those could be sent back, and that uh, then becomes a further part of the cascade, as we'll see later, and Jamie's going to talk about. Uh, so, you know, th this really wasn't uh, the hantaviruses that we knew about uh, really were not known to be uh, communicable in the true sense of the word, uh, that is, patient-to-patient -patient transmission did not appear, appear part of their uh, standard epidemiology. Uh, and so that, that remained true, I would say, throughout this outbreak. And sort of the normal uh, model of uh, natural history of these is that rodents become chronically infected. They probably are sort of front-loaded in shedding, but they maintain the virus as well as uh, transmit it to uh, among their, their species, but also to other species, humans, and uh, some other uh, rodents that occur in their uh, natural setting. Uh, and so uh, it's thought that a lot of the transmission is by aerosol, uh, secreta and excreta that becomes uh, airborne, either primarily or after it dries into dust, uh, being sort of the primary source. And uh, these were the sort of uh, principal hantaviruses that were known about. Uh, Hantan and Seoul are what, what are known as old world hantaviruses, uh, both of them are probably originating in Asia. Seoul virus, because it's associated with paradomestic rats, rodents, uh, was here in the Americas, and Dr. Jim LaDuke, uh, who was at WHO at the time, had, uh, along with Jamie, shown that the virus is present in uh, most port, port cities and large cities in the U.S. Uh, so we did have the virus, but the disease associated with that virus is really unlike uh, what was seen here. And Prospect Hill is found in a vole that occurs in uh, the U.S., but had not been associated with any human disease, and Pumala is uh, an old world virus occurring in Europe primarily. And then there, uh, this is sort of the distribution of Hantan and Seoul primarily, and this is uh, Pumala and Dobrava relatively at this time new uh, viruses that's closely related to Hantan but occurs in a different region. So the, the viruses are don't grow like uh, standard viruses that we work with normally, like Rift Valley fever, Ebola virus. It's very hard to isolate them. Uh, almost all of the, the isolates of the virus didn't come from human cases, but rather from rodents. It's somewhat easier to get them out of the rodents. They seem to have more of the virus present. And RT-PCR, which ended up being uh, probably a, a very important and milestone event in this outbreak, was uh, in its very early infancy at the time. So th this, again, became a big deal, and there was a, a paper published in Science, I think you have a, a picture of the lead page on, from that later on, but when it was published, there were uh, sort of editorials uh, about uh, what a remarkable event, uh, identifying this and uh, using the sequences that come from the PCR in a very useful way. And so, again, this was uh, one of the earmarks of this outbreak that made it a, a, a landmark. Here's a very brief description of RT-PCR. Uh, this is essentially a nested PCR. So the sensitivity is somewhat dependent on the amount of uh, RNA for the virus that's present. Uh, the RT stands for reverse transcriptase. Since this is not DNA and PCR really depends on amplification of DNA, you have to convert the RNA to DNA. And then there's a double swipe at amplification using nested primer sets that make this a very uh, sensitive assay. Uh, that's a good thing, but it can also, in some instances, be 
unfortunately a bad thing because it's easy to get cross-contamination in these assays and they're not particularly in this outbreak but in other outbreaks there are horror stories about false positives that uh, can arise from the sensitivity and cross-contamination that can occur. But this again ended up being uh, a very landmark. So here you see a couple of uh, patients, I believe, in their tissues with that uh, bright uh, dotted line down at the end being the amplomers uh, shown in a gel, which was at the time of this assay, uh, the way that we developed the assay. So this is uh, uh, DNA of a particular size that's uh, expected from the amplification process and indicates that those tissues contained uh, the RNA of the virus and that the, there was Hanavars present in the tissues. And then taking uh, those fragments and sequencing them, one can put together uh, using the genetic code a, a phylogram of what the viruses are and how they're related to other known Hanaviruses. And you can see with one of the names that this virus uh, that didn't stick uh, was uh, new, uh, probably most close related to Prospect Hill, another virus that occurred here in the New World, and the Pumala branch with the other Old World Hanaviruses being more distantly related. Uh, and this also, uh, you know, in the way that uh, nowadays is commonly practiced, allowed uh, some epidemiology to occur. So if you have a sequence and uh, there's some variation in the populations, you can view these uh, differences of the variation and make statements about the virus. So uh, one of the strategies that Jamie will talk about, I'm sure, is that case premises had rodents trapped and we had uh, in a number of instances, the sequence of the human case that occurred on the same uh, premises, and uh, we could show identity in a number of these rodents. And uh, in more distant uh, cases in the region, you might find that the virus was closely related, but often not so much a direct match or an, uh, a, a very specific match, like uh, it often was. And uh, you'll probably, Jamie will tell you, I guess, about uh, sort of uh, cases from other regions that popped up in these exercises. So this was again published in Science, I mentioned this earlier. Again, this is kind of a landmark paper in emerging infections and uh, uh, certainly didn't hurt the reputation of CDC nor the group that uh, did the lab work. I don't want to uh, let this pass without also mentioning one of the partners that we often uh, work with in uh, these emerging infections, and that's the uh, infectious disease pathology group. And uh, there were instances where uh, no uh, serum or blood was available and only uh, tissues that had been collected and fixed were available. And Dr. Zaki's group uh, went to some lengths to develop immunohistochemical assays that could identify the presence of antigens in the tissues of these patients. And not only uh, in the outbreak itself, but also looking back retro retrospectively. So I think there were cases as far back as the 50s where uh, individuals had noted that they uh, had uh, described or uh, prosected cases that had clinical uh, outcomes that matched this disease and uh, some of those tissues were presented and I think there's at least one or two papers describing uh, that. So here's, uh, this is sort of a retrospective, not uh, specifically a case, but here in the figure to the right, right, left, uh, as you look at it, uh, you can see uh, the presence of antigen, which are the red dots you see in the capillaries that line the, uh, the alveoli uh, of, the, of the lung that's here. And so this became uh, another means of, you know, demonstrating in a direct way some of the pathogenesis and gave us some clues about what the pathogenesis was. There's very little inflammation in the lung, and so it was sort of derived that a lot of this is sort of a, a, a misdirected uh, cytokine and uh, other immunologic factors that precipitate the capillary leak that leads to the uh, pulmonary edema. So again, this is a, a more specific timeline. So the preliminary laboratory tests you saw uh, on that fax were the fourth, and in spite of not really having much confirmation, that uh, immediately led to this open label ribavirin trial that was instituted uh, 
that uh, the uh, PCR was rapidly put together once we had an etiology because you have to have some knowledge of what you're trying to amplify in order to make a PCR assay run. Uh, the rodent guys, I think, uh, were dispatched uh, very quickly and uh, then the first sequence was uh, less than a week later. So that's pretty rapid by anybody's assessment. And I think the first rodents after the team got there were trapped on the 9th, and those were rapidly dispatched back to Atlanta. And uh, about the 40 rodents that were trapped at one case residence, 30% uh, of them were positive. I think they were all maniculatus, although I may be mistaken about that. So we sort of, uh, at least part of the circle became closed. And if you look further down, the rodent tissue sequences were then uh, rapidly developed and you could match them up with the uh, cases from the same premises. So again, sort of that really closed the circle on this. That leads to, again, that uh, I brought up that it's hard to isolate these viruses, but we nevertheless persisted. But if you look at the date at the bottom of the slide, it took a while. And what it took eventually was we took uh, a rodent uh, that was in the very acute uh, phases of infection and we took it into the BSL-4 and we actually inoculated other paramiscus maniculatus that were available from a, a commercial source with those tissues and we were able to isolate uh, thusly the, the virus, which then led to another issue. What are you gonna call this? And, in uh, the grouping of viruses that I traditionally have worked with, it's usually named after a place associated with uh, where the virus isolate was made, except that ended up being a political hot potato. So you can see here a number of possibilities, all of which were struck. And uh, uh, here's where uh, my presentation and Dr. Nichols probably uh, end up uh, bifurcating. Uh, he, he has the source of the name being someplace in California. And I don't remember anybody looking at maps of California for naming the Four Corners area of Iris. But, but he could be right. But uh, I do remember looking at maps, and we did come across uh, Sinombre. You can, if you just do a Google on Sinombre in New Mexico, there's a lot of streets with that name. There's a ski area in a mountain named Sinombre. There's a region that's called Sonombre, and that's my remembrance is that it's not really a specific place, and it's probably not one where we really got the rodents from which the isolate was made, but rather we've been shot down a number of times, and this was, in my view, a pretty good tongue-in-cheek approach to giving a name to this thing. So uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> So uh, then lab work went on after this. So we developed uh, specific serologic assays. Uh, uh, Heinz Feldman, who was a senior NRC uh, fellow, he's now the head of the BSL-4 NIH lab at, uh, in Hamilton, Montana, uh, cloned the nucleocapsid antigen and expressed it. And we began to use that in the IgG assay. And we, with the isolate, were able to grow up uh, antigens that were used in an IgM capture assay which we distributed to the state health departments here in the U.S., and we had a couple of sessions where we brought laboratories in and trained them. And we also had uh, friends in uh, vir virus laboratories where hemorrhagic fevers were interested, and we shifted the technology to them. And that, uh, in a later slide I'll show you, became the source of interest and a lot of uh, hantaviruses that were described and a lot of diseases that, in fact, were described in those regions. But it continued to occur here in the U.S., and this is uh, the most recent slide I could come up with on short notice after I should have said that Dr. Nickel bailed to go to the Ebola outbreak or to Geneva to manage the Ebola outbreak, and I got called in to this Sunday before last. And so uh, then I, I do appreciate the folks in Special Patchens coming up with the, the figure. But you can see that, uh, you know, the outbreak year was 93, and it's still the highest number uh, wrote, uh, uh, Jamie will probably describe more about why that might be, why it goes up and down, et cetera. But it still does occur, and it goes up and down, as you see. And uh, the, it's you know not altogether uh, associated with the southwest U.S., but if you look at the numbers on the maps, it still remains sort of the areas of highest interest. Incidents, sorry. And uh, finally, that point I made about the uh, virus uh, 
viruses uh, associated with New World hantaviruses uh, not being limited to the U.S. Uh, the viruses that have a, a red name are associated with human diseases. And in some of the tropical areas, uh, the case counts are much higher than they are here in North America, largely because uh, the number of rodents and uh, the density of rodents in tropical and uh, uh, subtropical areas, uh, and also sort of the, uh, probably the nature of the populations and their association with the land are also tighter and therefore the number of cases associated uh, with these viruses and their rodents is, uh, can be and often is somewhat higher. So with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. Childs who carried out the rodent arm of the investigations in the Four Corner area and a lot of the subsequent work that was done. Let me just say that it's great to be back to see, at CDC and see some old friends, you know, get, literally. And, <laughs> and I want to thank especially Phoebe Thorpe for putting this together and keeping us on track, and she did a terrific job. Thank you. So, of mice and men, or of men and mice? This was one of the rags, which uh, I love this cover. And just in case you're blind like me, you can see that this is our CDC representative out there in the four corners. Suspicions were rampant, as they always will be when you're investigating deadly outbreaks. And it's nature of the game. I want to take you back to 1993, because during that year and years previous, there was a fairly intensive operation out of Johns Hopkins, which I was a part of, looking for cases of hemorrhagic fever of renal syndrome among Baltimore residents. We were studying rats and also did some detailed epidemiological studies. And the prevalence of soul virus infection, as Tom mentioned, this is an old world virus, which presumably came over when Radis norvegicus was introduced in the United States, probably in the 1970s or perhaps earlier. And we were involved in not only looking at the virus and isolating viruses from rats in Baltimore, but also following up what might be the clinical disease. But first, a tour of Baltimore. Now, those of you who have been to Johns Hopkins, this is about two blocks away from the medical school and school of public health. And let's see, just to show you the remarkable situation, well, you can see the black arrows. And they are highlighting rodent burrows in these poor neighborhoods around Baltimore. And you can actually note the extensive amount of dirt which these rats have uh, Extracted, and often these cement backyards are cracking because they are hollow underneath. So finding rats wasn't difficult, and Phoebe actually blew up this image of me, uh, but it's mislabeled. It should say, there was hair. <laughs> and in any case, chose me outside of a refuse heap in an alley in Baltimore. And if you see that sign posted on the telephone pole, it says that this block was just treated for rat control. Our traps were full every night. Rodent control is extremely difficult, and there's never been a successful eradication program for Radis norvigicus in any city environment. Still isn't. So just to give you an idea of what we were finding, and what I have up at the top is the seroprevalence in titers for another rodent-borne virus, this one an arena virus, lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus, which we were also studying, which Tom was involved with these studies. And you can see on the left, Honda virus antibodies, anti-sol, were very rare. And we looked at huge number of 
individuals who came to an STD clinic. This was 1993, and we didn't know anything about HIV. But we were there, hepatitis C, collecting these, and they turned out to be valuable samples. Very few Hanton positive. But we went on to look at dialysis patients um, who had end-stage renal disease and also patients which had proteinuria with or without uh, renal disease. And in a series of studies, we came up with very high odds ratios where sole virus antibody, antibody prevalence was higher in these groups, not the background prevalence I showed you in the last slide, which showed that a consistent association with chronic renal disease, hypertensive renal disease, and these associations wouldn't go away no matter what we, uh, how we treated the data. So in 1993, we did have evidence of Honda virus infection in old world rodent with an old world virus. The only endemic virus in the United States was Prospect Hill, as Tom mentioned, and this virus was not known to cause any disease, and to date, it's not known to cause any disease. So we were fo focusing on rats, and at the time, CDC became very interested in these studies, and we were gearing up for larger studies looking at this association, but 1993 happened in Four Corners, and these aspirations were laid to rest. So the Four Corners. Now, I'm not sure, I think probably many of you have been on outbreaks. And you think the first thing you would do with an outbreak like this is rush to the field, which we did. But the problem was CDC per diems were so low <laughs> that we couldn't afford staying in the days in. And there was tremendous discontent. Uh, here we were with an unknown virus doing odd things. So Pat McConnell stepped in once again. He found us housing in the El Rancho Hotel, where rooms were named after various people. Uh, Jay stayed in the Ira Lupina room. <laughs> so it was the Ronald Reagan suite. Oh, yeah. I stayed in John Wayne's suite, of course. <laughs> anyway, after solving that problem, we had extensive meetings with representatives, including President Zah of the Navajo Nation, and once he gave us support, he gave us full support, and a number of, of individuals who were members of the Navajo Nation joined our team, which was essential. Uh, trying to find your way out there is a challenge, and dealing with the suspicion and uncertainty survive, uh, surrounding the situation, Navajo representatives were critical to getting us into the tribal areas. And this is our group. And I'll make a comment at the end. Close camaraderie develops between these people. And you see John Krebs with the fingers above his head. <laughs> with Leonard Freeland, who's a Navajo, who's assigned to us. Sue Harvey. Herman Shorty, who is critical to our investigations. Navajo of great humor. Um, very traditional, followed the um, ancient traditions of Navajo, including hanging himself from his um, cords from his, inserted through his breast tissue. Ken Gage from Fort Collins, and Rusty Enscore, who you can't see at the end, and Gary Maupin in the back. So this was a joint effort among CDC, Lanta, Fort Collins, the Indian Health Service, and the Navajo Nation. And everyone played a part, and it was a great team. Privileged to be part of it. So, as I'll show, we usually left the hotel around 4 a.m. after a few aspirin. And then we uh, would get to our trapping sites and collect our rodents. And then we would set up our processing center. And in the background is a hogan where an individual had died. And we would venture into the hogan, at least those who were willing to shave off their beards. And you'll see we had these full face respirators which are extremely uncomfortable. And it was only later in the um, investigation that we received our PAPRs, which are powered air purifying respirators, which are far more comfortable and blow some reasonably cold air over your face. This is miserable uh, 
actually, and sure makes me hungry and thirsty. And this is not only the after after we trapped, but this is the before. And it shows you what people, mammologists and ecologists, how they took precautions against hantavirus infection <laughs> before this investigation started. And I've circled some key features. A bunch of dead mice cut open. They had beer. Second circle. And you can see one of the mouse individuals. This is proper hygiene. This is proper sanitation when dealing with hantaviruses. Your comrade feeds you your sandwich. Anyway. <laughs> and actually, this, our findings did have tremendous repercussions on ecology and mammalogy programs because they were used to doing this. And after we discovered these viruses, they had the dressing gown and they hated us. <laughs> anyway, just to give you an inkling of what a profile of Honda virus prevalence uh, is shown in male and female deer mice. And this has now been a standard pattern, especially with the hantaviruses that we've studied in the New World, in which juvenile animals, those under 14 grams, are rarely infected, while those which are young adults become infected, and those which are adult mice are commonly infected, with the male always having a higher prevalence of antibodies than the female, which we ascribe to um, aggression, especially probably involved with mating. And one of the other things that we had discovered when we were working with rats is if you blow up the youngest age groups, which are shown in the insert, what you find is declining antibody prevalence. And this is we ascribe to maternal antibody passage, which protects these very young mice from active infection. So what you see is this is a childhood disease, and mice, the prevalence can be very high. Rats in Baltimore, when you reached adult size, had prevalences in excess of 80% soul virus infections. Here you see an excess of 30-odd percent for large sample size. Characteristic. So this was the first paper which came out identifying Paramiscus maniculatus as the reservoir host, and it was joint, it was typical of the cohesion between the ecologists and the laboratory scientists, and also the people involved in the environmental work out in the four corners. It was a very exciting moment, and this paper, of course, was a complement to that, showing that. Um, Humans were infected with hantaviruses, and their neighborhood rodents were similarly infected. The bad news. As Tom mentioned, Paramiscus maniculatus is probably the most widely distributed and populous of any rodents found in the United States. You can see its distribution occurs across the country, with the exception of some very eastern sites, and its kissing cousin on the right, Paramiscus leucopus, which is infamous as being the reservoir uh, for Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, also has an extensive distribution, but is much more common in the eastern seaboard. But it does get up in the Midwest, where they also have foci of Lyme disease. Um, and it also carries a Honda virus, New York one. And there have been, I'm not sure how many cases, I know there's been one death reported from New York one, but the major culprit of SNV and another virus, Monongahela, is the deer mouse. We conducted a household-based case control study where we were placing traps within the hogans which people died, which is often a depressing situation, you go in these hogans and you find dirty dishes in the sink, unmade beds, and the one there was a cradle, uh, hasty removal of the individuals. Um, that brought a lot of it home. But when we did these case control studies, we had a near and far control, and we not only compared 
lots of relevant details about food storage, et cetera, brush around the house. But the main thing which turned out, although it appears in the first bar, the rodent infestant was very high around the houses in which cases had occurred, but this includes a lot of small mammals. And we were finding antibody in a number of different paramiscus species. And later on, more extensive studies back at CDC indicated that these were additionally novel hantaviruses, each primarily associated with a different species of paramiscus or other rodent. The interesting thing was, although antibody prevalence was, much, was higher in the case households, it was not significantly different on statistical analysis. But this is a relatively small sample size. It's certainly suggestive. But what was significant is catching a large number of paramiscus within and around the households. So we called it a number game. More rodents, high prevalence, and contact was more likely to occur. One of the last things we did, and again, proof I was actually there, was train, I think it was seven groups of environmental specialists, many from vector control, because there wasn't much concern about rodents at this time, and how to safely conduct field studies on these potentially infected animals, and what sort of equipment you had to have. And this was very labor intensive, and the state health departments appreciated it. Very hot work, uh, set up in the parking lot, which was made available to us. And finally, a couple of the related products, and then I'll just tell you a little bit about some interesting findings on why this outbreak may have occurred in 1993. We published very early on interim recommendations for risk reduction, avoid mice, basically. Keep them out of your house. And what turned out to be a very popular publication at some length, published with Jim Mills, me Methods for Trapping and Sampling Small Mammals for Virological Testing. And this described the details of how you can safely do this. And long lists of materials you need, very detailed, and where to get them. Because this sort of effort requires tremendous planning Everything from buckets to and bleach disinfective traps to all the labels and all the traps to catch these things. Very extensive planning goes into this sort of work. Now, why worry about this now? And what brought this about? I, actually, that's not the title I wanted. In addition to CDC preparedness and the serendipity of having a migration from USAMRD, which worked on these hantaviruses, which were a military problem, especially in Korea. Um, Tom Kaisak, C.J. Peters, and Jim LeDuc. And in 1992, I followed from Johns Hopkins. But Tom et al. brought the reagents, which allowed the lab to crack the case. And if they hadn't come, I'm not sure what sort of reagents CDC special pathogens had at that time to look at old world hantaviruses. Finally, why 1993? And this is a interesting slide. Bob Parmenter and Terry Yates had a long-term ecological site, not right at Gallup or in Navajo country where they're following rodents long-term. And they had noticed paramiscus maniculatus problems just shot up in 1993. Later on, there were all sorts of efforts made to link that with the original outbreak. But the most important link is what we came to call the troph cascade, in which abiotic factors such as increased precipitation, lower temperatures, result in ecosystem productivity positive and earlier. So in 1992, we had mild winters promoting rodent survivorship, and in early spring, lots of plant and food for these animals, and the population swelled. And you can see that feeds into increasing fecundity and decreasing mortality, which increases the reservoir population abundance, SNV transmission, and ultimately human encounters with mice. One of the nice things 
about having a trophic cascade is you can measure these environmental variables. And what has become common now, if we look at the top slide, and Greg Glass published a number of papers, including PNAS, on this phenomenon, but this is a summary paper, quite long. What you can see in the images above, the green is good, and you can see that the variation over time in terms of uh, dry and wet habitat varies. And when he matched cases, he did case control study where risk was under 10% in the low risk population, uh, up to 25% in the medium risk population. And these were matched people who were infected with many controls. And then he could develop a predictive map based on the rainfall and temperature profiles. And it was a remarkable feat. If you look at the cumulative data over, um, this is from 92 to 96, the match between predicted and observed, predicted in light gray, observed in the black, was remarkable. And I'm not sure this has continued, but he's gone on to show a similar phenomenon in Argentina with Andes virus, which is, causes very severe disease in that country. Just to give you a sense of the camaraderie that develops, I recommend this book, Alexandra Levitt's Deadly Outbreaks. And we were called cowboys by Pat McConnell. So cows in Jane, in the, uh, whatever, in John Wayne suite, so shoe fits, and we worked long hours, we took a lot of precautions, and we often didn't get home till the bar at El Rancho was uh, closing, and we told them who we are, and we asked if they would remain open a little later to serve the nation's interests. <laughs> anyway, I have slides of acknowledgments that Phoebe put together with the field team, laboratory team and the epidemiology team. I'm not going to go through all these, but there are also other individuals at the medical centers at Gallup and Indian Health Service. And of course, we couldn't have done this without the help of the Navajo Nation and all these groups on the right. And there's the last acknowledgments. And with that, I will take my seat. Thank you very much. If we could bring the lights up, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So I have a question for, for Tom Kaizak, um, Stephen Rowe from the laboratory. Um, so you mentioned that PCR was a relatively new technique at the time, and, and did you um, recall encountering resistance to people um, believing the validity of the PCR test um, since it, it wasn't a very established diagnostic at that time? Uh, there was some doubt about whether we were correct in ascribing etiology to the Hanavirus, which we thought were, was present, that maybe it was just there as a, a matter of chance. And, uh, you know, I, I think in the long run that sort of died out as uh, cases continued to occur and uh, the pathology, the PCR, and the serology all continued to match up. And uh, we did do with NHANES sera, for instance, a look at prevalence, and this yeah. certainly wasn't a common infection, so I think that also would have helped uh, uh, people sort of understand that acute infections with this is not a good thing, so. Yeah, and I think there was skepticism in the field, particularly when we started talking about specific rodents, because everyone recognized that, well, these rodents have been here forever, why are we only recognizing it now? But that then also led to some look back investigations, and fairly quickly, I think there were some specimens from the late 70s that, uh, from a investigation in Montana that were identified as positive. And then uh, as time has gone on even earlier, um, and, but certainly there was that whole thing of, well, 
this is one test. When, when do we say anything about this? How much confirmation uh, do we need? And I think that's always a challenge when you have a surprise finding. And you know, really, the, the wrong place, the wrong organ, it just didn't line up with what we would expect to see with uh, the known hantaviruses. And there were, at least we were informed, that long-lived, um, well-respected Navajo leaders had recalled earlier outbreaks where a, there was a severe uh, outbreak or severe cases of a, a pulmonary disease following very wet springs. But this, who knows? One other comment I might make is that uh, this outbreak occurred in 93. Uh, I was also involved in the SARS outbreak in 2003. And uh, I hope there's nobody from FDA in the audience, but we didn't have a lot of insistence that this had to be an FDA-approved assay as we tried to roll it out to the state health departments, et cetera. Yeah. Just great talk, guys. Uh, just wanted to make a quick comment about seeing is believing. And on the same day of the PCR, we have the immunistic chemistry showing the virus in the lungs of these patients where we're dying. So same day of the PCR, actually showing it there, showing why these patients had a capillary leak syndrome. And I have to add, this is uh, Dr. Sharif Zaki, if people aren't aware, who developed the immunohistochemical stain. And being able to show that, as well as uh, pictures of the gels that Dr. Kaizak showed, were very helpful for people who were into the science and understood why some of us were even questioning, is this accurate or not? But as the investigation unfolded and uh, we were able to show the rodent trapping data as well as the epidemiological data that linked uh, exposure, particularly to areas like where I stored my, my Honta box, uh, and the risk of being exposed to aerosol dried rodent droppings, uh, it really came together pretty nicely. We did hear one disturbing anecdote of uh, a gentleman who developed the disease after cleaning out uh, a shed and, and commented that uh, I guess they were right. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, I hope it's not. Uh, but I think as time has passed, more and more people believe that this, this is the etiology uh, which the science still firmly supports. Hi, and I have a question from our online audience about whether there's a vaccine being developed for hantavirus. I don't think that uh, here at CDC there have been efforts, but uh, people at USAMRIT have been interested in vaccines, including for SNV. Uh, I mean, I guess one of the issues is that the incidence was actually quite high in certain focused areas, but you know, how would you deploy such a vaccine right. and what's the economic argument for it? The military has a little bit different view where they're deploying folks into areas of, uh, you know, suspected to being of high, uh, high risk. And so their, their model's a little bit different than a public health model. Okay. Yeah. Um, Question in the back. Hi, I'm Delight Satter with the office that Jay was referring to in Sea Stilts, the Office for Tribal uh, Affairs and Strategic Supports. So I wanted to kind of bring it back forward and back to Jay's comments about social determinants of health. When I first came to CDC, in 2011, I worked with Navajo Nation and Pierre Rolin, Craig Manning, to help rebuild trust uh, so that further work could continue at Navajo on hantavirus. And that continues to today. And we worked on a CDC Foundation application to work on health education and, and um, mass exclusion. Uh, but it, I think it's very important in this audience to talk about uh, our office being a resource so that uh, work that you're doing now or starting now can set forward in a good way to avoid some of the things that did take place that often isn't even us, it's other actors, perhaps, perhaps our colleagues in academia and other places, but we're here to help navigate that and support your work. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the speakers for an outstanding presentation, thank you. I'd also like to take a moment to ask anybody who was involved with the Hanta original investigation to stand and be recognized there in the audience. And also anybody who works in the Hanta virus now, 
Please stand. <laughs> and thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you in early November for the next Weaver there. <laughs>